It's a magnificently large animal which is meant or was meant to be the frame around the central part of the monument. Now, I set new ships in Yilling. That's not, that's not all the truth about it because you can see here and down here goes up again. This is in fact a large depiction of a ship. It's a stone setting which is exactly 360 meters long. 360 meters. That's the size of a modern bulk carrier or even the largest ship of these days. So this is a depiction of a ship as magnificent as no one could build it in the Viking Age proper. And why all that? Well, let's have a look on some of the sources. This one is a magnificent source telling about, in written uh, form, what happened or what was connected with Gilly. You have to look to the upper left, um, the first two lines, they get in fact up here what is written on the smaller room stone. Now it goes this way, up and down, the way the oxen plow the field, that's, that's called the bush Stefferdon way of, of writing. And it says clearly in Danish and with Danish runes, there's no Latin here and no Greek, I'm afraid. King Gorm made these runes in honor of his wife Tua, the pride of Denmark. She must have been a wife of real importance. Uh, King Gorm made this in to the honor of his wife. We actually don't know where he put up that stone because it was found in him in the 17th century and put up to the side of that one, which is really a large block of granite. Uh, and it was put up, as it said here, by the son of King Gorm and Queen Tuma, because it tells King Harold ordered these combos, which is an old Danish word, word for monuments. It means monuments. He made these monuments, and it means more than one. Made in memory of Gorm, his father, and in memory of Tuma, his mother. And then, Please notice, before we go on with the, with the inscription, he wrote it not only in runic alphabet, also he made it horizontally. It starts here, uh, it says King Herald, and then it goes on in four lines down here, and then it continues on the second side of the large room stone at the bottom here, uh, and then on the third side it ends here. And it's absolutely not uh, done without consideration because uh, there, at that point, the inscription ends here. So that means that his telling about his father and his mother and who he was himself, that ends here. Like looking at a book, at a manuscript, at a page in a, in a book. You could even describe this Glass stone as a church, as a decoration piece in a church where you have three main pieces where we could look at the main one in the middle, um, and that's that's certainly the inscription. Then comes number two with a large animal. You can see its head here, the eye, the ears, goes down, it has some magnificent claws here. It might be a lion. Well, we don't ever have any lions. In Denmark, but it might be the Viking way of showing a lion. And certainly, look here, it's fighting. It's fighting a large, fiercely dragon or snake. We don't have those animals. Um, we have small snakes, but not, but not the way this one is. So there's a fight going on. And what is said here now, it said that Harold, that particular one who was the king, that Harald who won for himself all of Denmark and Norway, that ends here. The last word is Norway down here. 
So that could be eventually a picture of the fight he had to go through in order to unite his kingdom, not only with all of Denmark, but also Norway. That's quite a lot. And then it goes on, and now it becomes really, really uh, some news. Because here you have what I think you can clearly see, in fact, that's a picture of Christ standing in front of his cross. Now, he, the, you can't see the cross because it isn't there. He is, in fact, tied up in a scroll uh, and again a, a serpent and a scroll is tying him up in a, in a depiction of the crucifixion. But please notice, he, he is wearing clothes, he is totally clad, apart from his legs maybe, and he has his halo around his uh, head and his beard. He is a grown up man and he is a victorious king. He is Christ, the Savior and the King of mankind and all the world. And that's clearly indicated at, in, in the inscription down here because Harold says, and may he held, made the things Christian. No discussion. It does not say he became Christian. Of course he was when he wrote this, but it says, I made the things Christian. How did he do that? We have no indication of fights, wars, and all things like that. It may, I think, have made its way to a new religion rather peaceful, but it had a long way to go from the first missionaries in the in the eighth century and until uh, Harold pulled up his stone, which he actually did at the middle of the 960s, 960s. Um, there we have some German sources indicating that at that time the German emperor had to consider Harold as not an enemy, uh, but as a, as a king with the supreme power, a Christian king. That was very important. Now, this picture, which is from about 1940, it shows the whole situation once again. Um, you have here the large moon stone, the small one, and this one, that's just a stone. There are lots of stones in, in, in the landscape here. Um, the church, you have the, the, the name here, the porch, and the rather large, and that's a point, the rather large council building here, and there's a small belfry here, which has been even taller. Now here you see the northern mound. Look, it's just as tall as the church, and it comes out here and it ends, you can just see here, it ends here. It's the last one. The picture was taken from the southern barrel who is standing at the edge here, and I think this, well, rubbish and things indicate that they actually did it. That's, it might be 1941, an important year during the German occupation of Denmark. Uh, now, and that's certainly also a point to make. Why did they start excavating? They started excavating because there was a general fear that otherwise archaeologists from Germany might have shown their interest in doing something here. Now, already in 1821, there was an excavation in, in the barrows in the northern, and then later on in the South Sparrow, that was 1861. In the North Sparrow, they found this particular nice and neatly worked cup of silver with inclusions of gold. And again, you have two animals interlaced. Um, maybe this cup was given as a gift for the person or the persons incubated in the barrel, indicating that they were actually Christian. It might have been a small cup used for, for, for church, uh, for, for church um, uh, communion. Now, this person here, in fact, to come back to the excavation history, we'll have to look at the person here, the man here. 
And you can see that this plate, which is uh, in Croatia, it, it, it was put up in Croatia some years ago because I met Victor. They even had a bus for him put up, and he lived from 1887 to 1961. He was, he was the state antiquary of Croatia for several years because his main career before the Second World War took place in the Eastern Mediterranean. He worked uh, especially with early Christian, and we could easily call them Byzantine monuments. He made his way through the imperial palaces of Thessaloniki and Split uh, uh, on the Adriatic coast. And he was in fact one of the leading archaeological figures uh, before the Second World War broke out in 1939. Then he had to come back to Denmark, of course, um, and he was the one who was asked with all his experience and skill to take care of an excavation in Yelling, 1941 to 1942. And that was commemorated and has been still commemorated several, in several places. Now, 2013, uh, one of my colleagues here is giving his bus just a little brush up on, on, on the neck. The, the, other, the other very nice person in, in the back, this, uh, he, became, he later became a professor of archaeology in Copenhagen, but he was an assistant to, to Aina Dukbe and made a very nice uh, memorial uh, script of him. Now, how to excavate a barrack? Well, you can tunnel it. You can do as they have done in Virginia, a place in the northern part of Greece, where you have found the, the, the grave of the Macedonian king Philip II, I believe. Now, you go there into it, and I was there some years ago, and there was a, in, a, a very uh, fine lecture by the, the local director, and then he stared at me at the end, and then he said, How do you think this looks like yelling, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> well, he knew exactly why I was there. Uh, now, this is another method because here I know Hitler, and you can see him, he's actually standing there in his trousers, looking through his the camera, and he was a keen photographer. Uh, he is actually taking pictures of some people down here where his laborers are working their way through the whole barrel. And please take a look. This is the last building, which was the, was the village or the town school. It could be placed inside the barrack. And so they had to take out a colossal amount of earth, and they did it by hand, which meant that the local community, which was very much hit by uh, unemployment in the 1940s, that they were uh, helping and that they got paid for excavating their own monuments. Now this is the South Spur, or the South Mount, and nothing, no trace of a pearl was ever found in that mount until this very day. What he did find, oh yes, he did find rows of great boulders, great large stones that more or less still standing in the places and it is obvious that the, the, the earth, the turf layers, you can see it was filled up by turf layers, the mound, that it is on top of these boulders. So these rows of stone were buried by the, by the mound. So what happened here? Let's, let's go on with our history. Now this is the North Mound, 1942. He used the same method and he knew what he was going to find because in 1861 uh, the Danish king of that time, who was called Frederick VII, and he was a keen archaeologist, he had made his way by a tunnel into the middle center of the mound. Um, and there he found beneath a block of rather big stones, he found and you can still see it here, you can see the wall made by large um, pieces of wood 
It's a timber construction, 11.11 meters. It's larger than this room indeed. In inside the mound, we found the pearl chamber of somebody. But, well, it, it was a disappointment, it still is. Somebody had broken into the chamber, taken out, well, who, who were there, and only left a little bit of what seems to have been one of the most exclusive, exclusively uh, furnished burial chambers which we have ever excavated. Now, you might have heard about the burials in the Viking Age where they buried a whole ship. The whole ship was burned. That was not the case here. They built a chamber, and you can see a picture here. I think Dupre deserves some admiration because he was so keen in, in photography that you can even look and you can enlarge his pictures and you can count the stones and you can see everything here. So that's what was what remained of the chamber burial 1942 in Yili. Yes, and there you have one of his uh, masterly drawings. He, he was a keen excavator and a very fine uh, architect, so he knew how to show to fellow archaeologists and architects how it looked when he arrived. Now, pieces of wood was taken out. We have been able to date them precisely by Denver chronology. So now we know that this chamber actually was built using wood which was felled 958 to 959. That, that must be the year when they made the whole construction and started to build the mound on top of it. And we also have another dental chronological dating from, from the time when somebody entered the room and took up whatever was there. And it says 966. So in fact, the people the person, the persons who were interred into the into the chamber here, yeah? they they he or she, I have to be very unprecise here, um, they did not rest in peace for more than let's say five or six or seven years. That makes a very good point here because where where were they taken? Who took them? Was that grave robbers? who took out all the furniture, gold and silver. Well, King Harold was in charge of the country. He was a great king. Would he allow somebody to rob some of the very most important great installations in the whole of his realm? I doubt it. So Duke came up with another explanation because he said, well, this has to do with the introduction of Christianity into Denmark. I told you before that the stone where Harold tells about what he did and ended up saying I did the Danish Christian was put up about 965 or maybe 963. That's the years where somebody went into the chamber. And that could mean that that one going into the chamber might have been Harold and his, well, men, of course, uh, taking out now we are at the guessing taking out his father or his mother or both of them and bringing them into another circumstance, into a Christian circumstance. The idea of Dukwit is that what we call in Latin a translatio, a, a taking out, bringing out of the cultures may have taken place, which is a very interesting, interesting theory, which we still very much uh, uh, taken care of. Now, Duke did something else after the war. He stayed in Denmark, well, he went down to Greece, he went down and did a lot here, and he even managed to write the final publications of the Danish excavations um, at Lindos on the island of Rhodes. Um, but before that, he initiated very much church archaeology in present day Denmark. Here you have uh, I, I shall not go into very many details for this, but this represents his results from excavating um, in a research 
way the whole of the council of the church of healing. You have it here. It's not a last room, but it's still about 10 or maybe 10 meters here, I guess, and uh, about 8 meters here. So it's a large chancel indeed. Normally, a chancel in, on a Danish church, a parish church, it will start here. That would be enough. Well, it's not a large, and he looked at that, took it. He knew what he saw. And he excavated and found a lot of burials. People were buried inside churches until 1806 in Denmark. He also found some of the burials were rather old. Maybe this one actually was covered by the eastern wall here. Nowadays, I must say this now, we know that the wall here has been put up later. So that burial does not indicate that it was older than the building. Uh, it's still beneath the wall, but it might have been put in some later event. What he discovered was the altar here, and he even thought that that stone here, which is shown in front of, oh dear, sorry. Figure. 
nowhere else in Christianity anybody ever saw a figure like that. A triangular figure connected not only with the northern barrier, northern one, but also going to both sides of the churchyard and then it had been covered by the South Mount uh, in the second part of the 10th century. There was a bell tower here later on in the 12th century. Now, here he, he, he's drawn those finds which indicated to him that there had actually been a stained church there and there was a pack of stone on the altar which had been made larger and then the stone church and then hard, hard stone. So everybody, everything fitted in in a triangular sanctuary which he believed was a pagan, a pagan monument made by King Paul and then changed by his son Harold into some kind of Christian monument. A rather, rather interesting situation which in fact depicts what I said before turn the pagan monuments into Christian uh, sanctuaries. That, that's the situation when people are left. You still have the two, the two mounts, you have the church, you have the moonstones, <coughs> and in order to tell people what else <coughs> must have taken place, he actually put up, put up new stones in long lines there you can see them. Today they are removed. I take personal responsibility of that because that's too much. I mean, he found no stones standing like that over here. We are actually here. He found no stones. You can see the socks around here and here they come and there they follow directly into the kitchen of the farmyard there. Um, he didn't find those stones, he found a lot of stones, but as I said initially, there are so many stones in the ground there, and everybody who finds a large stone somewhere on his field, they will, they, in my time, they brought them up to the church because Duke could use them. And he did. Now we have, we have taken them away. He also made these sketches, and I think they are rather interesting. Now, he wanted to show that this was a place of magnitude, of power, signifying not only King Harold, the new Christianity, but also the people of his days, those which we today call the Vikings, although a lot of them stayed at home, taking care of their fields and farms and so on. Now, this is, oh, this is the town hall of Copenhagen. You can see it on the plan here. It's more than a hundred meters long, and this is the facade which we have here, some 60 meters. Now, people are gathering here in thousands on the 9th of October 1950. Why that? Yes, it was because Winston Churchill was visiting Copenhagen for the first time after the Second World War. And now Duke was drawing those white lines here to show the size of the monument in Guinea. You have to imagine that this is the town hall over here, and then comes his rows of stones coming up here, and at the far end, another mound. It's a large place, it's a large uh, square in central Copenhagen. And if you take the monument in Yale and put it on top of this monument, which is the holy monument of Delphi in Greece, you can have, I think, an impression of how large it actually was and still is in the days of Turkey, but it continued. This is what we know today because excavations have been intensively taken up again in some 10 to 15 years ago uh, by a project which is led by the Danish National Museum and I'm proud to say that in a shorter time, 
year or so, we're going to publish all this. I'm actually working on the publications, part of them myself. And uh, uh, what we found was, in fact, and that was really, really astonishing, because I was sitting in my office in Copenhagen, and then the telephone rang. We, we didn't have those mobiles at that time, but it rang, and I took it, and somebody said, well, I am excavating here, and it runs, and it runs, and it continues eastwards. Oh, north is up here, as you can see. It continues. Then I, well, I said, follow it. Go on. He, he rang again. It still goes eastwards. Okay, go on. And then he phoned, well, now I have an angle. Not a, well, a corner of something. And what happens at the corner? It goes south. Go on, south. And there you can see what came out of several excavations. Wherever you have this black line, there was a, the remains of a magnificent palisade which measures 360 meters, 360, 1 meters, 360, and so on, forming a huge parallelogram uh, which has as its absolute center the burial chamber in the North Mount. The blue lines are to indicate how they may have made it using, uh, I don't know what, ropes, sticks, uh, some kind of instruments in order to make it so exactly, precisely, that they also integrated the stone ship, which you have here, it's sailing here, oh, 360 meters, I said it is, and it certainly is. Uh, and there we have from new excavation analysis the eastern part of what certain was not a church building, but a building corresponding to the ones which we have found over here. In principle, you can see they are uh, a bit boat shaped, and what we have are the post holes, and there's a porch here, another porch, and a, and a south separate room. Maybe it was added. You have the same here to the west and to the east. And there you have also, I'm not saying this is a church, I'm just saying this is the first building on the spot. And down here we have the date of this magnificent uh, palisade. <coughs> because here yeah, there is there is a pond, it's still there, and they actually built across the pond and along the pond and that meant that exactly here posts, rather large posts, they are 27 centimeters uh, in, in diameter, they were kept wonderfully preserved beneath the water. You could take them up and date them precisely by the chronology. The date runs between 958 to 985 and one sample, indeed 968. Now, we are in that same ten years, ten, row of ten years, where Harold declared Danes Christian. So, what we actually have here, I think, is a large area. It's 12.5 hectares. I showed you the picture at the very beginning of this lecture. A large area where he could probably assemble his laws, his sea lords, his war lords, the great chieftains of his realm from Norway and from Denmark and asked them, now we are all gathered here, do you recognize me, Harold, as your proper king? Well, what should they do? Because he probably had some, some soldiers standing around here just looking at their weapons. So they might immediately say, yes, you are king. What about my son? Yes, he's our future king. Now, I, I'm making a little bit of fun of this, because, but we know that somebody who, who wanted to become a king, had, they had the habit of sitting on their ancestors' grave mound, asking questions about what to do about this and that. And then I think he pointed to his new runestone and said, take a look 
read what's said here and especially take care of the end of the phrase made the Danes Christian. So now you're all Christian. Hello. Uh, which means in practice that now we are a Christian nation which the, which the German emperor cannot make crusading raids into because, well, I'm a powerful king and we have the same religion. That means a lot. Now, this is how it looked to, in the north uh, eastern corner of, of the enclosure. There, I suppose you believe me, we have the northern part of the Palisade and it comes down here. Look, that's an archaeologist sitting there. And you can see that there are posts standing at, at, with, an, with the same distance between them and then the palisade was built between those posts. We think that this was, a, that the wall, the wooden wall which was, was about four or five meters high. A tall wall of wood which you could see from a far distance it may, might even have been whitewashed or painted, what do I know? Um, and the peculiar thing is that with the excavation, oh, a bit too early. Oh. Yeah, that's a reconstruction. You can see that, and I, I apologize for the line being not totally straight because it was totally straight, but it's difficult to make these things on the uh, in the proper way. You can still see uh, the same archaeologist who was standing, he's still left there, uh, but the house has been reconstructed with its extension here and its porch. You have another one up here and the third one there, and probably what was in the center of the whole, the whole enclosure may have been, or was probably, a house of the same type. A very important thing is that outside the palisade there's never been some kind of, uh, of earthen wall or, or a moat. Normally if you make a, a, a castle somewhere you have to protect yourself, you would not make, make it 12.5 hectares large. You have to have thousands of men inside that. You have to feed them. And you have to know where an eventual enemy will enter to move your own forces across that large area. It's 360 meters, and if the enemy stops here and you are over there, it takes quite a while to come over, and they'll start shooting at you. And there is no moat here. It's only the heap of earth which comes from the excavation. You can see a shovel lying down there in a peculiar way. Now. I think, as I said before, this is a monument to a great king and we can look into Nordic prehistory and see that he actually used elements from uh, other monuments. Here you have in present day Sweden, I think you can recognize these as stone ships, not as large as in Italy, but there are, but there's another one there, and then there's a mound, and if we go to Norway, here we have large mounds, and one of them actually contained a ship, a real ship, which had been brought onto land. And here in Uppsala, in central Sweden, we have a whole series of large, really large mounds, uh, and a church which was added in the Middle Ages. So Harold actually used the elements which he and his people knew from beforehand, um, especially also here, where you have a reconstruction of the excavation results from a large memorial site on the western part of the main Danish island called Silat. Silat. You have a lake here, a holy lake, because Tisu means the lake of the god of war, who was called uh, the bull. Tia means bull in Danish, or in old Danish. Um, now, on the, on the shore, on the western shore of that lake, a magnificent chief 
and had his main building here. We know it was whitewashed and painted, perhaps. Uh, it's some 60 meters long. He had a, well, he had a small house for himself, being less than 600 square meters. Um, or was that where he invited people to come to join him in, 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 fest, in feasts and in celebrations of their gods? Maybe that was the way, because to the south there was a smaller courtyard with a very special house there, uh, which does resemble what we look, can look at in present day Norway and Sweden when we look at their oldest um, and the most simple wooden churches. So the idea here of the therapy is, and I think that's acceptable, that here there was a central sanctuary which was in the procession and the hand of the chief, of the great man who owned or whose family owned this large, not only a, a memorial site, but it was a site of trade and worship. It was an it was populated with some hundred people or even maybe a thousand people permanently. It's a small, a small start of what never actually became a, a town. Around 900. You have the same pattern here as in Gillen, in another place in eastern Jutland, uh, where you have the way in here, then you have the, the present church. And before the church, you had a memorial hall, the way, or the same shape as this one, but smaller. And then you have the last palisade in two places going around. Now, what was the idea of this? It was, in my opinion, to combine the magnitude, the wealth of the king and his power and his new Real Denmark and Norway and the new face of the Danes. And doing that, he also might have looked upon what they had done down in the German Roman uh, Imperial uh, Court. Because, uh, well, you can see the word translator, which means taking up, bringing force. That was made the idea to make a magnificent mausoleum. Uh, the word we have from King Mausolus in Eastern um, uh, Minor Asia. And here you have one of the German kings, Henrik I, called the Fraula, who died in 1936, and his queen, Matilda. And this is their commemoration place. They are actually resting here in Eastern Hills, and in front of a large construction here where Matilda had brought in her collection of precious relics of saints which she had acquired from all over Europe, including uh, Southern Europe. We can point to another example of the same kind. This, in fact, is the central part of the octagon chapel, court chapel, of the Emperor Charlemagne who died 814 and who was a Frank, uh, Frank king who became Roman emperor in 800, crowned by the Pope in Rome. He actually built this magnificent chapel where he was sitting up when he appeared to the, well, to the court. He was sitting up here, looking down to his uh, court assembly uh, and his family and, of course, he also had an, a great hall here, a hall where to gather with his best men, his nobles. Uh, you can still go there, of course, the chapel is there, the other buildings are not, but we know them from excavations. And these large imperial uh, court palaces, which were scattered all over the Frankish and the Ottoman Empire in the 9th and 10th century, they were actually visited by Danish uh, royal representatives. We know that they were there not to, as equals, because they came to negotiate with the kings and, and the emperors, and they have seen these imperial stone-built 
uh, large buildings. And when they came back to King Harold, or when he had seen them himself, we don't know that, he then took up, I hope I have made that suggestion clear, uh, he took up the idea of arranging his memorial in Gilling as the national, as the national monument of Denmark. They could even look at how kings and queens, emperor and empresses were buried together. And that's probably maybe the inspiration for Harold and his court architects. They could also look at precious pieces of furniture in the church, for instance, in, in northern Italy, in Milan, Milano. There is a depiction here of two men worshipping the, the Virgin Mary. And on the other side you have a holy bishop and you have a queen and her husband, the emperor. Well, that one actually is Otto the first, and he's also one of the two up here. And the woman here, her name is Teofana. She was a Byzantine princess who was brought into the Ottoman Empire, present-day Germany, married to Emperor Otto I, and and here you have an other depiction. You can see Otto. Emperor, which means emperor, and over here somebody wrote in Greek, I believe it is, yes it is, Emperor Imperatrix, meaning queen, and up here Theophan. Christ is directly blessing the royal or the imperial uh, couple here, and somebody is trumping down here, probably, probably a large servant to the, to the, to the emperor. Another picture which is more or less contemporary with the great runestone and yelling, you can see even more, even more clearly, you can see Teofano, the queen, she is kneeling here, the husband, Otto II, and this little one is Otto the Third, their child, their son. And if you doubt it, you can look here, Otto Imperator, which means that no, yeah, they had, there were three atolls in a row, so that was easily done. And here you can see Sanctus Mauritius, he is the person standing here, telling Christ, these are my special people. And on the other hand, the Virgin Mary, Santa Maria, is also, well, even stretching down her hand towards the head of Theophan. And up here, the signs of, of Christ uh, as a savior and two and two angels. So in this, this is a book binding. You can see the whole idea of bringing a royal couple. These are an imperial couple into the great connection of Christ and and the, and the Christ, Christian faith. Exactly what Harold did himself here when he depicted. Christ crucified and just mentioned down here, not what was what the picture actually shows, but that he how made Danes Christian. Now, this is the end of because one question is, what did all that mean to ordinary people? Well, we do know of a few excavations. Uh, giving an impression of wooden churches in Denmark. Uh, I, I do not dare to show you any reconstructions because they are, well, it's tempting to do. So what I show you here is a church which has been dated by Denver chronology to just after 1100. A few years after 1100, this church on the central part of the island of, uh, of Zealand was built in its first construction period. And that means that here you have uh, oh here you have the, the the chancel and please again notice it's not that long as the milling. It would be up here. You have the chancel here 
and the bell tower is a later, a somewhat later addition. This plan is the present plan. You have the main altar here, you have the stalls, the chairs, the benches for the congregation, and they sit here just like in the bus, looking at, at the, uh, the vicar uh, giving a sermon. And here is something very interesting, I shall come back to that, because there's also a kind of special chapel in the western part of the church. Now, up here we have the first way of furnishing the church, so to say, and it's very, it's very interesting to see that excavating any stone churches from the 12th century almost always, if something of that is preserved, sure that they had the baptismal font standing here in the center, so to say, of the name, which means that when people came in through the southern ports and the northern ports, they immediately saw the baptismal font standing on a rather tall fundament. So it's the center, it's indeed the center of the church is to get baptized. Some people could sit here on a, on a new bench. Some of the people could sit there, then they had one altar, another altar here, this one for the Virgin Mary, and that one almost always for the Archangel Michael. They were the two important saints in, the, in this part of, of the church. And then up here, the main altar, uh, which was consecrated to the special saint of the whole church. It might also be Michael or, or Mary. And please observe, the mother of God, we, and she is a real important person, we all know that. Um, she is in the north. That means nobody, in my opinion, should start about calling the northern entrance uh, less important than the southern. It's a whole here, yeah. it's a kind of central room which, which they also know a bit about from home because I just wanted to show you here, this is a part of a wooden house uh, from, the, from the end of the 12th century and the man here is sitting on a low bench, uh, exactly the same type as the one which he would sit on when he visited the church. Now, this is a reconstruction. People would appear through the southern or the northern ports. Some of them may be the, well, the owners of the church, or the initial persons, or the most important persons who knows, could sit there and the rest would stand in the lane, or they could have had their own chairs, loose chairs as we have in this room. Uh, they never leave any traces. Uh, and windows, rather small windows, high up, giving a dim light into the scenery. Of course, the font, which we still possess in the church, uh, must have been painted in vivid colours. That changed a bit. Around 1300, the church had recognised during the beginning of 13th century, that people in Northern Europe, more or less the whole of Western Europe, were not that very, very Christian. They started to a mission, a re-mission to place, and saints like Saint Francisco of, of Assisi, uh, his uh, friars appeared in Denmark in the 1220s and started to preach intensively in front of people, in the street, on the fields, in the church and of course they preached in the language of the people, not in Latin but in Danish whenever they were in Denmark. And here we have I think one of the results because now oh, because now they have added more benches. More benches were added, the font is still the center, they have added more light to the room using larger, larger um, windows that still appear from the south and from the north. And this part of the church has been, 
not secluded, but adorned with another bench in front of the western area, and then a large porch here. It's magnificently made in chalk stone. Um, and in the room there, they have a tractor window and an altar. It's quite unusual to have an altar in the western part of the church, really. But entering here, they could go into this particular and very important chapel with the altar and the priest standing here, looking eastwards and making solemn processions through the whole building. This, in fact, was also combined with, you can see four posts here and one here. Maybe he had a pulpit or two, so he could walk up and stand in front of his congregation making sermons, just as did the friars of the Franciscan order and the Dominicans. These pictures again show the development of the church um, and, and at the bottom again the way it looks today. So, asking the question in a bit of another way, who did, who did make the Danes Christian? Well, Hell said he did, but when did they actually become Christians? It took a long time. We are a little bit more thoughtful. It takes a time to convince Danes about being uh, something new or to adopt a new faith. That's quite a lot to ask people. And you can still see it today that the great majority, and I'm really, really using the word great, great majority of Danes, we are still members of the church. And people stay there, although they don't go very much to church. They pay their church taxes. They want the churches to be there. Um, no discussion. Even people who have left the church pay their church taxes because they want the churches to, to stay and remain. And I personally hope they will.